Good afternoon and welcome to the third session of the Vital Village Networks for Opportunity for Child Wellbeing 2022 webinar series, Levers of Change in Action, Unpacking the Now Playbook. Through this amazing three-part series, we have heard from NOW network leaders and others who are applying the levers of change outlined in the NOW playbook in their communities. So to wrap up this series, we'll hear from a phenomenal leader who is working to foster, advance, and promote sustainable community leadership in his daily practice centered on just food systems. As we begin our time together, I'd like to acknowledge that we are continuing to strengthen our language justice practices. And this webinar series will be available in Spanish with interpretation services provided by the Community Language Co-op based, or excuse me, cooperative based in Colorado. So I'd just like to pause for a moment um, to get us oriented to the proper language channels. And I'd like to welcome Maria Elisa Fuller um, to tell us a little bit more. Thank you, Rhonda. Good afternoon, everybody. Maria Lisa Fuller here with the Community Language Co-op. I just wanted to take uh, the space to thank the host for allowing this space and for their continued efforts to promote language justice in the different spaces. I am going to give you quick instructions as to how to use the interpretation tool. We're going to enable it in a minute so you will see the globe icon in the bottom of your screen. This is interpretation. You can click on it and feel free to choose the channel you feel more comfortable with, either English or Spanish. We do suggest that every folk in this webinar selects a language so they can hear all the participants in this meeting and webinar. Buenos días. Uh, buenas tardes con todos. Mi nombre es María Elisa Fuller. Soy parte del Community Language Co-op. Quería tomar el espacio para agradecer a los anfitriones de este evento por su continuo esfuerzo y compromiso a favor de la justicia lingüística. Lo que haremos hoy es que vamos a iniciar la interpretación en un minuto. Usted verá un icono de globo terráqueo en la parte inferior de la pantalla que dice interpretación. Por favor, dé un clic en este icono y puedes poner, escoger su canal de preferencia, sea inglés o español. Uh, for those who are joining through a tablet or a, um, a smartphone, please click the three dots, uh, tap on them, and then you will see the interpretation uh, feature enable, and then choose the channel you feel more comfortable with. Para quienes están viniendo por medio de tablas, de tabletas o de teléfonos móviles, por favor, eh, les pedimos que vean unos tres puntitos que le den un clic ahí y pueden ahí escoger la interpretación sin inglés en español. I am ready, Rhonda. I'm ready uh, for this webinar. Estoy lista para todos. Y bueno, pues, buena suerte. Good luck, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome. So we'll turn on our language interpretation. And so uh, um, at this time, please take a moment to select the language that best suits your needs. Um, you can follow the instructions on the screen. So we'll keep on uh, keep on moving forward. Um, today's webinar will be recorded and posted to the NOW forum within the next few days. Um, I also encourage you to engage with us by sharing what's resonating with you in the chat box and submitting questions through the Q&A icon. Um, our guest speaker will have an opportunity to respond to um, questions a little bit later in the hour. So wanna just share a little bit about our time together. While we will only be together for one hour, it will be an hour full of learning and exploration. So we'll share a brief overview of the Vital Village Networks and now, followed by an introduction of the NOW playbook, and then we'll hear from Pantaleon Flores III, and later you'll be able to pose questions before we wrap up. So while many of you have been with us for a while, I'd like to welcome those who are joining us for the first time and offer a very brief overview of Vital Village Networks and NOW. We are a collective of change makers committed to pioneering sustainable approaches to transforming child, family, and community well-being. We are rooted in Boston with a broad network and a broad web of peers across the country, all connected through our networks of opportunity for child well-being, better known as NOW. We are bonded through our guiding principles of creating shared spaces for belonging, learning, engaging, and transforming our communities together. 
To hear more about our work and share your own stories, we invite you to visit the NOW Innovation Forum, where you'll find access to a variety of tools, resources, and stories of leaders working collaboratively to shift what it means for our children, our families, and our communities to thrive. Now, if you have not yet had a chance to download a copy of the NOW Playbook, I encourage you to visit the forum, but after the webinar, to get a copy. The playbook is designed as a living guide to what it means and how it looks to transform community capacity to advance equity. It can be read as a book or used as a reference tool, but either way, it's meant to be read and reread as often as necessary. It's based upon five levers of change that we have found to be integral to community-led change, centering racial equity and healing, implementing shared governance, engaging communities authentically and with dignity, data storytelling, and planning for sustainability. The playbook features stories of what each lever looks like in action from communities across our vast network. Um, it includes key strategies from the village um, and of course, helpful tools and resources. And so throughout this series, as I mentioned earlier, we've heard from change makers whose work embodies these lever of changes, levers of change, should I say, from various angles to uplift and support children, families, and communities. So now that you've been oriented to Vital Village Networks, and now I'd like to transition to today's speaker, Pantaleon Flores III. His bio and links to resources will be available in the chat. Um, so I encourage you um, to explore them following our time together. One last thing, um, we're trying something new in this series. So we encourage you to not only listen, but also consider what you're hearing and what actions you might take um, to advance your own work. So following this session, you'll receive a reflection guide for your personal use um, to help you unpack what you've heard and think about how you might apply it to your own practices. Um, and it will be available in both Spanish and English. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Pantaleon Flores III. Panta, welcome. Hey, Rhonda, thank you so much for having me. And uh, thanks to everybody for, for joining and, and listening along. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen real quick. And we can get this going. All right. Make sure we start at the beginning. All right, so we're here today to talk about um, a concept that I've been thinking about for a few years called uh, food is a public work. And here's a, a picture of my farm uh, and some sunflower production that I did uh, this year. Um, so I would be remiss uh, to not talk about my roots in agriculture. Uh, I, I started at Spiral Gardens Community Food Security Project um, in Berkeley, California. It's a, an educational nonprofit an urban nursery, an urban farm, uh, and it's it, you know really centered on people, power, and community. Um, you know, being the co-director there taught me so much um, about growing food and also growing community, um, and really opened my eyes to what's possible when we use the public resources that we have and when we advocate for ourselves to be able to use those resources to help even more people. So the Spiral Gardens example, they were operating and are still operating on a 99 year land grant from the city. And when I learned that, it really just it like opened up a section of my brain as to like, we have resources that are public that can be used for these amazing things. Um, and that really set a lot of the tone for a lot of the ideas that I've come up with for Food as a Public Work today. Um, so my farm is Masewal Kuali Farms. That means the people's farms in Nawa. Um, it's a no-till, no-fossil fuel machine farm that's focused on food sovereignty, seed sovereignty, cultural food stewardship, and reimagining food ways. Um, so, you know, I've always uh, been really trying to root my work in, in food sovereignty movements and uh, seed sovereignty movements especially. Uh, just a quick background on some of the stuff I'm doing there. I have some breeding programs for seeds that are from Guanajuato, where my great grandfather came from. So currently in stewardship, a variety of corn, a land-raised pea, and two different kinds of peanuts. There's one pictured here. 
Um, and then that also includes doing ancestral research. So you'll see the Florentine Codex uh, in, the, in the middle pictured here. It's a codex from the 1500s that actually includes um, instructions, indigenous instructions of growing corn. Uh, and I also use that in a SARE research study. So sustainable agriculture research and education um, that I'm sure I can find a way to link you all to if you'd like to read that as well. Uh, and then also there's a picture of the top of my little one's head picking some corn with me. Um, they helped me jab plant the corn and we're, they were out there. Well, I jab planted while I front packed. Uh, and um, then they were there with me when I picked some of the first corn this year from what you see in that picture. So th that's also super important to me um, when we're talking about cultural food stewardship and seed sovereignties, things that they get passed on and thinking you know, multiple generations into the future with our work. Uh, my farm is started with land access from our city. We have a what's called the Common Ground Incubator Farm. It's a six acre site uh, housing, I think currently nine operations. Um, you can operate for $100 per acre per year. I operate on about an acre. We have city water, we have a tool shed, we have communal tools, and also an outdoor wash and pack station. Um, this is one of the primary reasons I moved back to Kansas, my home state, uh, from California, where I was working for Spiral Gardens. I don't know of many other programs that give you that kind of access. Um, here on the map, the, the farmer with the shovel, that's where we're located, kind of just outside the city limits. Um, and it really is, I mean, that land access component is really foundational to being able to do any of that sovereignty work. Um, and so, you know, it really is an amazing program that gives you, like, I would not have had an option to operate a farm without, without this program. I wouldn't have had the capital to buy land uh, and start or anything like that. Um, with that said, I also have to acknowledge that with the access that we have here, as a farmer, you are still here, <laughs> kayak not included. Uh, floating in the river in the bottom of the Grand Canyon, trying to find your way in agriculture. Um, like I said, you know, we can, we can praise all the programs that we have. We also have to acknowledge how big and hard it is to get into agriculture. So uh, I found myself here, this tiny little dot um, in, in the river. I did get some lifelines. Uh, again, this is all really building towards the idea of food is a public work. So for example, the first farmer's market I went to charged me nothing to bend there. It's a all year round market that moves inside when it gets cold here in Kansas. Um, and that gave me market access. Um, there were also private investments and small grants that have helped me along the way. And through the pandemic, uh, CARES Act II really provided me a lifeline that I needed to continue the farm. Um, and so there's definitely been some assistance along the way. But then you still find yourself in the storm and occasionally you find yourself in the eye of the storm, which if anyone knows that, uh, that's temporary, <laughs> unless if you can run really fast. Um, so, you know, I still had all these things, despite my access, revolving around me, you know, food apartheid, I saw it every day, I made decisions to not eat my own food that I was growing, because I could sell it and turn it into rent and bill money. Um, I knew where I was in juxtaposition to the to the poverty line, the federal poverty line, and, and the people around me as well. Um, the philanthropic survival loops became super real to me when I realized that, you know, $5,000 racial equity grants are just like little band-aids and we can't just like small grant our way out of that huge equity gap. Um, I experienced systemic and interpersonal racism uh, at market, even um, people asking me, like, who do you work for? Um, you know, those kind of those kind of things. Like, are you really a farmer? Are you just a hobby farmer? Are you it's like, no, this is this is what I do for a living. Um, market access issues. Uh, other markets are expensive to get into. The main farmers markets aren't cheap. And I did have some sponsorship one year, and that was great. Again, in the eye of the storm. Uh, land insecurity. We when I started I had the option to have three three-year contracts, so I could stay there for a total of nine years, which is not land permanency, and without uh, familial wealth um, or a whole lot of assistance from people who are already in farming, that's it, it's not really a secure path to having uh, land security. 
uh, the financial insecurity that comes with all of that, uh, the lack of infrastructure, you know, we don't have cold storage um, at the incubator farm currently. Um, and just the fact that selling food to me was spiritually draining. I believe that people should all have food to eat. And it was really hard knowing that I had to continue to sell all these things from all this access that I had, um, knowing all of the things that were around me. Um, and so these are the things I'm thinking about through the course of, you know, the th first three years of the farm um, that are just like constantly on my mind while I'm working, constantly in my face when I'm at market. Um, and I, you know, over time made a bunch of realizations. Uh, realization one, uh, we have a county food system plan. We have a very thorough, like five goal, 98 sub point food system plan that was made in 2017. Um, that meant a lot to me. It said the County Food Policy Council knew the direction that they wanted to go, and we just needed to match programs to fulfill that. Uh, goal one, so thriving agricultural producers and food sector workers. Uh, goal two, prioritizing natural resource conservation uh, and maintaining working lands, so maintaining our agricultural lands and keeping them in agriculture. Goal three, build and design communities to ensure food access, foster health, and eliminate food deserts uh, or food, food insecurity or food apartheid, as I would call it. Goal four, having a community that fosters an equitable food system. And goal five, having a community that eliminates waste in our local food system. So we have these five goals um, outlined. And uh, from that point on, it, they just need projects that that actually check off those goals, right? We need to we need to take that into action. Um, another realization: I was working with our Food Not Bombs chapter. Um, we were feeding, you know, between seventy to one hundred folks per week for more than just a year. But for the purposes of my realization, I calculated out, you know, what is our economic impact of doing this for a year? Um, and it was over $200,000. I mean, we were working off of some grant money in that homemade project shown on the screen, um, but primarily mutual aid. Um, that's what Food Not Bombs is, is designed to do, is to work through food, uh, mutual aid. And the realization here is with so few people, so we're talking about like six people per, per time, you know, cooking and serving, or less. A lot of times we operated with less. We're having this direct you know, service $200,000 impact in a year. And that doesn't account for the other impacts like um, like crime prevention. You know, we're feeding people, we're keeping people from committing crimes based on the fact that they need to do it to survive, right? We're thinking about, um, you know, economic health impacts of feeding people and feeding people very, very healthy, well-rounded, balanced meals. Um, and then, you know, just there's so many more impacts, but the realization here was a meal a week can have a very, very large economic impact. The next realization is the trends in food insecurity in our country, right? So 1995 uh, was the first um, current population survey. Uh, and we could go back further than this. And our, I'm sure our data would say about the same thing. We have had between 10 and 14 to 20 to like 18% food insecurity in this country, despite having programs that are supposed to offset that. I mean, that to me is longitudinal evidence that the systems that, that are in place right now are not working. And this is where I lose a lot of people. Um, I've had a lot of people accuse me of wanting to uh, destroy SNAP, for example, and I'm literally someone who has survived on SNAP. I don't want to destroy SNAP, but I can recognize that SNAP is a consumptive model. It is a model that is attempting to purchase our way out of the problem. And we have longitudinal evidence that shows that this, that this does not work. You cannot just simply consume your way out of the problem. That was a really big realization and something I'm continuing to kind of grapple with. Another realization, our city has a lot of money. <laughs> there is a lot of money out there. Uh, we're a small town of like 130,000 people, and our city has a 400 million plus budget, right? We we invest that in things. We put money into, you know, important things like fire and medical, for example. Um, our parks has a huge budget. Um, our, you know, we have all these things that we're already prioritizing with our dollar. And, you know, when you prioritize something with a dollar, you're really showing where your priorities are. Um, and so 
you know, I'm sitting here thinking, well, why don't we invest in food production for the sake of solely feeding people, right? If we can't consume our way out of a problem, can we potentially produce, since we're talking about a food, uh, food resource, can we potentially produce our way um, through this issue? And so, you know, what if we invested city money in funding farmers who literally just grow food locally, which is also e uh, economic and environmental impact positive, um, and try and produce our way uh, through this issue? So of course, all these things considered, all these realizations happening for anyone out there who's looking for this workshop as like a true workshop sense, this is, this is kind of point one. You find that policy, you find what someone has promised and said that they want to do and has codified it, has put it on paper and, and you say, okay, let's go, let's do it, right? Goal one, living wage, public work, ag jobs. There you go, goal one, check. Goal two, on city or county lands using sustainable ag practices, check. Goal three, that produce direct, fresh, and prepared food resources outside of consumptive models, check. Goal four, guided by people from highly impacted communities while actively addressing the fact that non-BIPOC producers control 99% of US farmland, equity, check. Goal five, I don't know, I think we can work it in. I think I just worked all four goals in already. Um, Maybe somebody else can pick up goal five, or maybe we can incorporate that in there. I love closed loop systems. Um, I think you understand my main point. We've got these four massive goals covered in one project. So what is it? What is food as a public work? What does it look like? Um, it's a public land project. So we're finding um, endangered and or un underutilized agricultural land, preserving it um, as a public good. Um, we're creating producer equity by, um, you know, really looking at like, who can we enfranchise who's currently super disenfranchised in agriculture. It's also a climate action project because we're going to be doing things sustainably. Um, we're going to live within our means. We're going to work within our means. Uh, it addresses those food policy goals and it operates on about a million dollar operating budget with the potential to uh, return five to $6 million in fresh food and also prepared food. Because as someone who's, like I said, survived on SNAP, you can't just throw vegetables at someone and say, you're good now. Because I was working, what was it? 31 hours or 30 hours a week after the ACA dropped and my university decided to cut my hours to not give me insurance. Not bitter about it still. Uh, working full-time, going to grad school full-time and still food insecure. Um, and so, yeah, prepared meals is certainly in this and that food, not bombs component, um, most definitely inspired that component as well. And just from having been there, right. Uh, I'm an in-group member of people who need food and have needed food and who have been insecure, um, food insecure. And so that prepared component is very, very important. So what does it look like when we really break it down, when we look at this as a department of food uh, of farm workers, right? So we have parks and rec, so think parks and food, I don't know. Um, we have uh, 16 people in the department, let's say, for example, this is our $1 million operating budget. Uh, those farmers are working across vegetable, orchard, and animal production, in addition to food logistics, because obviously we need you know, labor hours dedicated to getting that food there where it needs to go, understanding where that food needs to go. Um, and then also a project manager who's mainly focused on logistics. Um, within that, we have areas of specialization. So we're really focusing on um, everything that we truly need to operate. So food safety person in a uh, vegetable orchard and animal, a culinary arts and preservation person in vegetable orchard and animal, um, and conservation resource management people within those categories as well, um, so that we're truly uh, managing and stewarding our resources and understanding where we are within bigger systems, uh, because again, the sustainable com component is extremely heavy. And then we also have people who work across um, those categories. So we have, you know, like an orchard person who also specializes in vegetable who can do perennial herbs or an animal person who does vegetable who works on animal integration plans to make sure that we have systems that are safe for incorporating animals um, 
especially as we know that many indigenous sciences show that having animals included in your system uh, is incredibly important and beneficial. And then likewise with the orchard. Um, so you've got extremely well-paying jobs, which were, uh, you know, I came up with that number. That number has a reason. I took all of the county positions that deal with land. I took our, our GIS folks. I took our county, um, our county uh, noxious weed specialists, our county parks people. So anybody who's like works with land, I added up all their salaries and that is what we pay on average currently for people who work on our land in, this, in, our, in my county. Um, so those aren't just like, let's give farmers 60K. It's like, hey, we already pay people who work with the land this amount of money. Why not also fund the farmers in that same way and respect their labor? Um, so I kind of have a breakdown uh, on the other side of the production value, the salary and the budget, a subtotal infrastructure money to also start it because obviously you're probably going to have to build some stuff uh, in order to you know store vegetable and, and process some stuff. Um, and so you still have a really massive uh, public benefit, um, even in the first few years of operation. Obviously, you're going to need a couple of years to get that orchard really up and running and producing. Um, but you can focus heavier on, on vegetable and animal production in the beginning and then kind of even it out over time. Um, and, you know, a lot of these production numbers are coming from farmers who have shown me their, their spreadsheets, right? I mean, this is, I think, 14 and a half. Uh, FTE full-time employee hours dedicated to production. Um, and this is what people have told me they can produce with that amount of labor. And so these numbers aren't just like, you know, I threw them on a spreadsheet and said, yeah, let's just make the math work. No, like the, this is what agricultural businesses are able to produce. Um, and it, it's very much rooted in, in reality and, and it's very pragmatic. Um, if we want to go think even bigger picture, there's this thing called the farm bill that happens about every five to eight years, depending on uh, which, you know, which cycle it's been. Uh, this last one we spent or allocated $428 billion. Uh, most of that goes to nutrition programs. Um, if we were to take 1.2% of that spending, 1.2% of that, of that $428 billion, uh, we could set up 52 food as a public work projects with $100 million farm endowments each. So every state, D.C., Puerto Rico, for 1.2%, that drop in that bucket. Um, and if we, remind, if we remind ourselves, the operating budget of these, um, of these food as a public work projects is a million dollars. And so if you think of you know, each one of those getting a $100 million farm endowment, I mean, we're talking potentially 50 years of operation, 50, 60, 70, you know, depending on if there's state or local buy-in to help to help sustain it. But we're talking about a very long time in one year of one, you know, cycle of farm bill. Um, that would be an amazing, uh, you know, test run. Um, and so again, drop in the bucket, that money is there. That money goes out constantly. Um, and it and a lot of a lot of times, so if we think again about the consumptive model, um, you know, we're collecting tax money. We're allocating it to folks who need food, which is super important, incredibly important. Like I said, I have survived off of this. And then that money is going into private businesses. So public money through the people who need it into private, you know, enterprise. Why not public money into public good and service into public direct service, right? So the production model versus the consumption model. And I can't say it enough, like that money is there. It's again, our, our priorities um, and our imaginations about food systems and what they can be. And then the question, where does the food go? <laughs> where, where do you, how do you know where to go? The well, the people you're hiring are also food logistic, logistics people. They are going to be people who can study the systems that are in your local area to understand where the food goes, how it gets there, what's the best way to deliver it to people, what kind of prepared foods and cultural relevance do you need to include in that as well. Um, and I, I want to include 
uh, this element of targeted universalism. Uh, I heard about it from Dr. John A. Powell. I think he's at UC Berkeley. Um, and it's the idea of setting universal goals that can be achieved through targeted approaches. Um, and so the results of that are that you're actually measuring success rooted in a universal goal and not rooted in like XYZ group has a disparity. Let's get them up to where like the normative culture is or whatever. So you're you're really just saying, what do we really actually want everyone to have, right? And so in our case, we want 100% food security, right? Um, so that's our universal goal. Step two in targeted universalism is to measure the overall population. So again, very similar to how we, how we look at things right now. Uh, step three, measure population segments. So finding communities and being rooted in communities and understanding those communities and segments. Um, and then understanding the group-based factors that cause that, right? So if we want to think about, like, for example, food deserts are based on proximity to uh, grocery stores, essentially, right? I'm going to really boil it down to that. Um, we also know that there was this thing called redlining that, you know, forced communities to be what they are up to today, literally. Um, made it so that businesses and enterprises wouldn't set up shop in certain places. Uh, and again, being very race-based. Um, and so then we have, surprise, no grocery stores in certain neighborhoods uh, based on certain population segments. So step five comes in and then you implement target, targeted strategies that will bring everyone up to that 100% food security goal. Again, looking at a universal goal and not looking at this group has these disparities because that really just perpetuates so many of these like super unnecessary and untrue like negative stereotypes about so many different groups of people. If we were to more focus our energy on finding universal goals and helping everyone based on the factors that are actually impacting groups that they are in, uh, we would get a lot further in a lot of different work that we do, I think. So yeah, I just wanted to briefly kind of touch on uh, on that idea of targeted universalism. Uh, so, you know, we have all these, all these pieces together, problem identification, uh, the way that we're doing it hasn't worked for 30 years. Um, we have uh, programmatic precedent. So we have programs that are preserving agricultural land, so environmental stewardship for uh, people to be able to get access into agriculture, right? We have this, this, this is already a thing. We're already doing it. Uh, we have an established plan. We have something on paper that the government has said, a government entity has said, we want to get these, these things done. Uh, and then we have, you know, in-group members and stakeholders like myself, um, you know, BIPOC producers are very few and far in between. And there's a lot more reasons for that. We could do a whole nother workshop on, but, um, yeah, what, where do we go? Where do we go from here? Uh, I'm here, right? Uh, one thing we do is we continue to talk about these things and we continue to uh, to workshop the idea. You know, where where the idea is today is only there because I've handed it to so many people, so many organizations, told them to rip the plan apart and told them after you do that, piece it back together with me. Um, I wouldn't be at those numbers that I'm at with production had I not talked to many different types of farmers. Um, I wouldn't be where I'm at with a lot of the com uh, community components without um, my, you know, my people power education at Spiral Gardens or my place uh, as a fellow uh, in, you know, Vital Villages Community Food Systems Fellowship. Um, and so what do we do now? We, we talk and talk more about it. Um, currently, I'm doing a local letter writing campaign. So again, here's another point of entry for anyone who's wanting to you know, make change where they're at. Um, this, is, this is just how I have it set up. We're going to be collecting letters of support. So individuals, families uh, can write a letter together um, about why they would support this project or whatever project you're, you're working on. Um, you as the organizer will collect, um, you know, collect those letters, collect a way to contact those people, um, get yourself to a critical mass of people power. So get yourself up to a certain number that you feel is suitable for, um, you know, organizing and presenting to 
the powers of the purse, the people who have the money and who have the power to decide where the money goes. Um, so here we're looking at, <clears throat> we're definitely in, in, uh, in step one and two, still collecting letters. Uh, I'm trying to get us up to 100, if not 150 people here locally. Um, and once, I, once that's done, you know, I'll have to go back through and say, all right, it's time for us to go. Um, and read our letters all together as a community to uh, our county commission, to our city city commission, um, and our, our city manager. You know, bring them to our city manager as well. Um, and there's a lot of ways that that can look. You know, it might not be all 200 of us show up on one day. Uh, that's just scheduling, and life happens. Uh, it might be we show up for four weeks in the 2030s numbers uh, over time and, and really show them how serious we are about um, what we, what we want to see. Um, and, and just show them, you know, like, this is the plan. We've all thought about it. We all have the support. Um, let's, let's find a way to fund it. And so again, when you're, when you're planning these kind of things, you got to know, you know, what those cycles look like. So for example, here, um, our budget cycles, they, they finish the budget out at the end of the summer. That means we've got to make sure that our timeline matches up enough to get in, get into the conversation, be a part of the conversation, um, and convince the people that we elected to actually support us, to support us financially and get that done in, in the next budget cycle. So we're looking at um, a big push in April uh, locally to, really get that conversation to those folks and and push it through. Um, we also just got a letter of support from our food policy council. Um, that took a little while to get to, you know, I had to present a couple times to make sure, you know, that folks had uh, questions answered um, and felt comfortable with what the plan was and how, how their support looked. Um, very thankful to have that. Just got that last September. And then ultimately, uh, you know, for example, a city line item allocation, our budget ended up being 439.6 million. Literally less than half of a percent of that could start the project in year one and a quarter of a percent um, could sustain it every year after until we hopefully, you know, create a food system where we don't even need it, where people are so involved in agriculture that food is food and food work and food ways is a part of our life because uh, it's really sad that so many people are disconnected to it and I can't blame them at all for being disconnected to it it's years of years of years of disconnecting decades of disconnecting us from from land and from that production and the and those systems that are so you know central to being who we are um yeah a lot of factors there that we could go into also so you know, reconnecting people to eventually not even need this because that's the other component to it. Um, I only want to do work, justice work, that eventually won't need itself. I don't want to become, uh, a, you know, a model of, and I'm going to use the term, I might lose people here too, the uh, nonprofit industrial complex that sometimes, you know, just feeds into enough of the solution to keep their jobs. Um, I don't want that. I want food as a public work to become obsolete at some point um, because we don't need it anymore, because we've recreated or reimagined our food ways to where we where it's just not a thing we need to fund because it's a thing we all do. Um, and so that's another thing that I'm coming from, another angle I'm coming from is that I would love for this idea to also one day become obsolete because we all have food. We all meet that universal goal. The other thing I'm seeking is Farm Bill Advocates. So if you saw uh, that Farm Bill is about to run out, meaning they're going to need to uh, write another one. And it's, you know, it, it's not a short term thing. They're typically five to eight years long. Um, like I said, this this is a drop in the bucket. If we wanted to pilot this literally across the entire United States and D.C. and in Puerto Rico, we could do it with a single sweep of 1.2% funding um, and not even touch it for the rest of the farm bill cycle or next two or next three if we're actually setting these places up with $100 million farm endowments. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a bit different than what we typically see in, in that farm bill. It's a lot of money out 
And I know there's a lot of economic uh, uh, impact in that. And I can't remember the exact number, but I think it's like for every dollar in, oh, somebody is going to call me on this later. It's like four or more out economic impact wise. Um, but I mean, this is this is direct services, right? Again, we're talking about publicly derived money going into a public works program or even jobs program. People in the legislature understand a jobs program, that's their language, right? Into direct uh, public benefit. So yeah, if there's anybody out there listening who has some sway in those conversations, um, we should definitely talk. I want this to be a, a project that spreads um, across across the country and uh, really helps us reclaim our food systems and food ways and also prioritizes uh, people who've been disenfranchised for the last, I don't know, four or 500 years from something so central um, and so important to, to our existence as people. Um, so, so many angles on this. It, it sounds like a really big endeavor. Um, I'm a little bit early on, on that, which is odd for me. So I think I might actually go ahead and stop there um, and open it up uh, for some questions, reflection, comments, uh, and that kind of thing. Awesome. Thank you so much, Panta. Um, there are definitely some questions that we've had come in. So I'll start with the questions in the chat box. Um, just going to share a quick refresher for, um, for those who haven't had had a chance to add any questions. If you'd like to add a question, you can do so by adding it to the Q&A um, as shown here on your screen. But let's jump into these questions so we can take. So one of the first questions we have, this one is I'm pulling from the chat box. It says, if this is implemented, how would your farming practices change on your farm? What budget items could or would be replaced by this expenditure? Um, I think, you know, one of the one of the other key components to this is that I'm not trying to sell my farm's model as the model to do the job, right? Um, I've had this pointed out many times to me that when I say I'm a no fossil fuel farm, they say, well, that's not where the problem is in agriculture with fossil fuel. And I and I totally agree with that because science and numbers don't lie. I know the problem with fossil fuel in agriculture is in the transportation of those goods. And so um Ultimately, food as a public work has like nothing to do with my farm. It, it, it's attempting to be a model where the people who are actually doing that work are the ones making those decisions and being responsible stewards of that public good and that public money to um, to do what they know is best for their their watershed or, you know, their their geographic region. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess to kind of get back to the question uh for me honestly with the no-till no fossil fuel component especially the no fossil fuel component having more people i could still do it on a bigger scale um and so you know if i were in one of these things locally and we as a group again remember we're a government office we're a government body we we are responsible to each other internally as well right we have those checks and those balances internally i would push for practices that are like mine but we would have a democratic decision-making process about what we actually end up implementing. Um, so I know that doesn't directly answer the question, but I guess if I directly answer it, it's like, it has nothing to do with my farm and it has everything to do with whichever local community does it first. And I've said this many times, like somebody beat me to it so that I can be like, hey, my own city government, you see them over there doing that thing. It's bringing the results that I told you it would. Can we please start it here, right? So somebody please uh, also beat me to it. No, I think um, it's, I mean, that's super clear in, in saying that you're advocating and, and encouraging folks to do this work and come together and take some ownership and leadership on their own. Yeah, so um, there's a, another question from the chat and then I see we have some in the Q&A, so I'll get to those in just a moment. The second question from the chat says, do you work with other coalitions in your organizing? You mentioned food, not bombs. What about the Kansas chapter of the National Young Farmers Coalition? Yeah, so I have actually worked with the national uh, chapter of the National Young Farmers Coalition, um, and it didn't go well, if I'm completely honest. It really didn't go well. Um, uh, 
I was in a meeting with the two executive directors and I wasn't alone in this meeting either. I was with a couple other fellows at the time who were fellows with them and was met with a, a lot of resistance if I'm if I'm totally honest about it and uh, was met with uh, one, of, one of them even saying, so who are we going to steal money from to do this? Who are we going to take money from to do like, who, who are we taking from? And I was like, first of all, <laughs> uh, BIPOC centered equity project like we don't we don't ever take like everything has been taken from us so there was like that first component and then i don't know things kind of just derailed from that moment on honestly um would love to connect with the kc chapter i know the kc chapter isn't national but i do know that uh i have apprehensions of working with them as an organization for ways that they've treated me and other farmers i know um I would say I'm more prone to work with like food policy councils and people who are actually tied to making those kind of policy decisions and passing them on to people who can actually just like enact them um, and take them on as recommendations. Um, I had another another one of these farm nonprofits uh, who was supposed to be, you know, really taking land and making it uh, a public good again just completely say like, nope, we're not gonna touch that idea. So I like, I have a lot of apprehensions about working with uh, with those kind of like food and farm nonprofits a lot of the time. Um, I have had a few champions in that too. The Kansas Rural Center, for example, uh, has really given me a lot of platform and it, it really likes talking about these ideas and, and opening them up to other people and has really helped along. So I don't wanna, I don't, obviously I'm not saying that, you know, all of these food and farm nonprofits are like, a certain way or whatever, but I mean, if you really want to focus your efforts on governmental change, work with those governmental bodies first and foremost, and organizations who want to join you in those conversations with the direct decision makers will join you. Um, uh, I think Kansas Appleseed is another example of a local organization that has uh, has joined me in those conversations, and it's honestly a lot better that way because you get you get that organic organic momentum. Uh, building up and you don't have to worry about like some kind of organizational um, like uh, I guess agenda uh, that may not be what they're what they're showing out of face but uh, kind of behind the scenes so I'm sorry if I sound a little bit jaded about this but like I've had a lot of roadblocks for nonprofits to be honest and so you know working with the people who are making the policy is, is something I highly recommend. And also please reach out to me. Like if uh, the KC chapter of Young Farmers wants to talk more about it, I'm not for pulling seats away from tables. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll set as many chairs around the table as possible and I won't sit you down, but I will keep those chairs uh, open for folks who wanna, who wanna join uh, uh, in, in honest and, and, you know, with reciprocity. Yeah, and I think something that you said early on in, in your remarks sort of about who do we have to take from this scarcity mindset too. So it seems like there's so much to think about in terms of the mindset of who we're partnering with and how are they thinking about this work. Like there is enough food, there, there are enough things on this planet um, and it's all a matter in how we use them and how we look at them and, and how we think about what we have and that reciprocity. Um, so I could go on and on, but again, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this next uh, question says, um, hello, thank you so much for share sharing your experience and knowledge. Could you share more about the longitudinal evidence you mentioned about consumption and purchase, um, for example, with SNAP, um, not working as a real solution? I feel like I agree, but I haven't heard anyone else mention this before, so I would love to learn more. Yeah. So again, I think the reason people don't bring it up is also the scarcity mindset, because if you bring up the fact that it's not working, you have a whole bunch of people who would love to defund it and starve folks. And I think we know what side of the aisle those people are on. Um, and so that's probably one of the reasons why you don't hear people talk about that, because if you look at the evidence, you look at long term, what has changed in food insecurity, the answer is nothing. Nothing has changed. Like we have maintained between 10 to 14% food insecurity the entire time. Um, and so, you know, when people hear you say that, they, they automatically put you on this, oh, you're, you're trying to like defund SNAP and you're trying, no, I'm trying to look at it 
um, from a numbers perspective, I'm trying to look at it from the fact that nothing is changing. And like, at a certain point, you also have to ask, well, why is it set up this way? Why is it that we take government mo- or like people, the people's money, uh, put it into a government program, which isn't, I'm not trying to demonize it, and then send that money off into the pockets of private industry. There are reasons for that. Um, and if if nothing changes over the course of multiple decades, they're probably not great ones. And we have to reimagine things uh, and we can't keep repeating the same system without changing it in any kind of way. Um, if we want, if we want something to change, if we want that number to change. And so it's a hard conversation to have. It's a very like nuanced conversation to have, but that's, that's what I line up. I line up where are we at with food, food insecurity over a long time? What have we been doing? The same thing, trying to consume our way out of it over a long time. And it just, it, it doesn't work. It's not working. And I actually want to add a little bit to that question, because what came to mind is how does maintaining food insecurity, how does that serve the government? And then how does that, how is it a disservice? Like, what does that add up to as a disservice to our communities? Yeah, I mean, it it adds to a disservice to everyone in that we have, um, you know, we have people kind of like bad health outcomes. We have bad educational outcomes that lead to bad, uh, bad jobs outcomes. If we want to talk about jobs, right? I mean, all of all of that is connected. If you don't have enough food in your stomach, you are not going to. I mean, you're you're going to do whatever you have to do to get to the point where you do have something in your stomach, and it's not going to be living your best life, right? I mean, what what do we honestly have to lose when everyone is fed? We have literally nothing to lose. I. I, I had a I had a like a, a, a pretty emotional conversation with a, a SNAP educator one time who uh, I think when it boiled down to it was they're just afraid of losing their job. And my thought on that was if everyone was fed, what would you be doing with your life? Like what would you want to do? like would you be a painter? Like would you have the imagination to go out and like start your own farm, grow some flat? Like, I don't know. Like, do you really want to continue doing that work? And so I think everyone's quality of life. Um, it can only really go up if we have everyone fed. I don't I, like it's not even that's not even like that shouldn't be controversial. That shouldn't be like, oh wow, I don't think it that that's so just should be understood. And I think everyone does understand it. And it's just how do we get there? Um, and it kind of goes back to the question: the consumptive model isn't really how we get there because we've proven that it's not getting us there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Us. So incredibly powerful. And again, it goes back to this mindset that capitalism has sort of set us up to believe that there's not enough to go around. A um, few other questions here. Can you explain how the money is going toward private business or private businesses? Sure. Okay. So um, when I was on SNAP, right, you get you get your benefit. Um, and then where do you go with that benefit? You go to, you can, you can go to, to farmer's markets. There's like the double up bucks, like food program and stuff like that, but you go to the grocery store, right? Uh, let's say like for, I'm just going to use me, me as the example again, let's say you are working 40 hours a week, going to graduate school full time. You're not really having time to cook meals, right? So where do you go? You go to that middle section of the grocery store. You go to that like prepared food section of the grocery store, which is also the most processed, and the worst for you, um, but is the cheapest and easiest way to feed yourself. And so you you go and you buy things that have Nestle on the back of it, right? You go and buy things that have the 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 labels of these companies that are destroying our earth on multiple forms and multiple fronts. And then you are destroying your own body, just trying to survive by doing what you have to do because you don't have time to have someone hand you a bag of vegetables, go home and cook it and have a good meal that you deserve. Um, and so this, that's, that's the consumptive model, right? It, it, it goes from SNAP beneficiary to grocery complex and, uh, and, and, you know, this, this big processed food complex for the most part. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it keeps you in that cycle, right? It absolutely keeps you in the cycle. Um, so this one's a real simple question. So where do we begin, right? How do we get involved? Um, and whether you're someone who's, and I'm going to just add to this question a little bit, whether you're someone who's sort of been in this work a little bit, or really just trying to step into it as a layperson, like, where do you start? How do you begin? 
Yeah, let's start with that first part. Someone who's like really starting from scratch. Um, you got to know your community. You got to know what the real need is around you and you got to be connected to other people. Um, connecting to other people who are in similar situations as you is 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 key and making sure that you are um, you know, an in-group member and not coming at it from a saviorist perspective, right? Um, and so you you start there, you find your people. Uh, the next thing is you find, you, you figure out what the power around you is doing, right? And in my case, I got real lucky. They're, you know, like getting people on land to start their own farming operations. They have a food systems plan that has really ambitious goals, highly outlined goals from a food policy council. Um, and like that, that gave me so many steps ahead of where a lot of places currently are. And so you gather your people, you figure out what power around you is doing and how it's moving and, and, and where it's headed. And then you find ways to try and influence that. And, you know, a few years ago, I never imagined that I would eventually have a letter of support from the Food Policy Council uh, on their own idea. You know, that's something that came through work and discussions and conversations uh, and meetings and stuff like that. And so you, you, you know, you work with folks and you build and you network and you find ways to um, ha have the government essentially put these things on paper as things that they want to do and say they want to do, because then... Uh, at the end of the day, you can hold it up and say, like, I thought you wanted to do this, right? Um, and that can be one of the strongest ways. I know um, it takes a lot of resources to get people into offices and to stay in offices. That is a whole nother level of, like, thing that I'm not even ready for, like, helping with even. Uh, but I know that's another way that people often propose as uh, ways to change things is to get people in those positions, get people on food policy councils, get people into commission seats um, uh, and things like that. Uh, for, for the folks who have been in it for a long time, ask you, look yourself deep in the mirror and ask yourself, how do I get out of this job in a way like in a way that's like, how do we all get out of this work? How do we all perpetuate the fact that we need to keep this job? What are we doing? that is perpetuating these syst the systems around us. And what would I do if food security wasn't an issue? Like, mm -hmm. let that inspire you, right? Like, let that, let that speak to you and, and, and motivate you for, you know, for not just like Band-Aid fixing these problems, but like ending them, right? And, and being honest about, you know, your organization's past, present, and you know, coming together and finding the people within your organizations who want a very different future because the past has been very consistent and very not great. It's been doing what it's been doing. It's doing what it's designed to do. Okay, so I know we're close to the end. There are two more questions. I really want to get to at least one more. So we're going to try and be quick <laughs> so then we can wrap, wrap up. Um, so the last question that we're going to be able to get to today says the USDA has recently focused on developing regional food centers and bolstering locally sourced food and farm to school programs, etc. Do you think there's room in this system to include and incentivize land stewardship and perhaps your work within that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I actually am a district level farm to school coordinator. Um, I work for USD 497 Lawrence Public Schools as the district level farm to school coordinator and also the work based learning coordinator. So I am really actually trying to start ag programs for high schoolers to get directly into this work and tie them into this work. So I, I am absolutely uh, uh, working on that. Would you remind me some of the other components to that question? Yeah, it said, um, just do you think there is room in the system to include and incentivize land uh, stewardship, land stewardship? So those are some of the other pieces in that. Okay, yeah, sorry, I, got, I just got really excited about like getting young folks involved into it. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, okay, so let me also, I kind of forgot to say this, and I really appreciate this question for this. Um, the incubator farm program, right? If you wanted to try and convince your local government to do that, this is kind of the equation that I've thought of. It's, hey, city parks and rec, hey, county parks and rec, you have a two acre site that you constantly maintain and cost you resources and time and money and all these things. What if you didn't have to steward that land and you had an agreement with someone to steward it in a very sustainable 
way that produced food for our local economy, people, et cetera, right? Because that's what that is. Like this was a six acre site that had to be maintained, which costs cost money um, by the city slash county. And they took that and made contracts for people to then steward that land. And they no longer really have to do much there at all. Like we have city uh, city folks like contract out people to like mow the very small areas around our, all of our operations. And that's basically it. Um, and so I think the the work that can be done is, is kind of that equation and helping them understand that bringing more people into that land stewardship component with agreements, obviously, because you've got to, you have to know, you know, what you're doing in order to like, you know, to really honestly take care of something. And that goes for like anything. Um, you know, you're really giving them resources in a lot of ways. And they're, you know, it's, it's, it's quite mutually beneficial. So I think that's one way that you can, you can kind of approach folks. Awesome. Well, Ponta, thank you so much. I could go on in conversation with you forever, especially about um, sort of work-based learning and connecting it to teaching and learning and, and, and connecting it to the community and starting with students. We have to talk about that online another day. Um, but I just really want to thank you for for sharing um, with, sharing with us about food as a public work and sort of how you're shifting the narrative. And we just really appreciate your work and you sharing um, with us. Um, to our participants, I know we're just after two o'clock. Thank you so much for taking time um, from your day to join us. I really hope that you can take a few minutes to reflect on what you've heard and thinking about your role and how you might begin to shift your thoughts and practices around um, fostering, fostering spaces uh, where children, families, and communities can thrive, especially as we think about food. Um, we look forward to connecting with you through our forum, through social media, and seeing you in 2023 when we launch our next webinar series. So join us then. Um, with that, have a safe and happy holiday season. Please take care of yourselves, take care of your families, take care of your communities, take care of each other. There's a few things in the chat, grab them real quick. Ponta, again, thank you. Um, and we'll see you all in 2023. So be well. Bye, everybody.